right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Today we have one of my favorite groups, Wearscape, with uh, Michael Whitehead and Jason, and we'll, listen, we'll hear from them in just a moment. Uh, Wearscape was here twice before. This will be your third time here, I guess. No pineapple lumps this time, though. I'm really disappointed. The last time you were here was August 10th of uh, last year, so I think we have a lot to hear from you. It's been well over a year. It was uh, Michael and Jack Howard uh, and Chris Stewart. And they're not here this time. <laughs> so this time we have Michael Whitehead and Jason Laws. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys, and you three can introduce yourselves. Thanks, Claudia. So my name is Michael Whitehead. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Wearscape, which I, as I was explaining to Claudia, I now take as code that I, uh, the founder means I can't be fired quite so easily. <laughs> and. Um, I'll be doing the first part of the talking, and then um, after that, Jason Laws, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Jason Laws from Wearscape. I have the same accent as Mike, based in New Zealand as well, uh, and I uh, am the Chief Architect at Wearscape. And Mr. Scott. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Scott Humphrey, and we really appreciate that you folks are, are listening in on Wearscape's BBBT. It's good to hear from all you folks again. So, so somewhere, somewhere in this demo is a major piece of sprinkling of fairy dust to make all this hang together. So if you can, uh, She's cute. If, yeah, I know it was the best looking fairy picture I could find. If you can, if you can I'll find, I'll take her dust. If you can find a spot where that is, good on you. But um, I'm not going to talk about it at the time. It will just appear to all be one thing. But it we'll may tell you quite afterwards. Well if you can't pick it, we'll tell you where the fairy dust is afterwards. <laughs> it beats the child labour pictures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> wait, 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 what was that? Morning. I missed it. I missed it. <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you Wearscape 3D. I'm going to do a simple source system discovery, followed by data profiling, followed by designing a, star, a simple star schema based on the source system. Now this is a similar thing to what we showed here two years ago when we launched 3D, using the current version of 3D however, instead of the version we had two and a bit years ago. The, then once I've done that, I'm, I'm then going to do it in an automated way. So I'm going to do it the manual way first, and then I'm going to show you the new automation wizard we've put over the top of this. Then we'll send it into Wearscape Read and actually build the data warehouse in Wearscape Red. Are you so, doing it as a data vault? <laughs> <laughs> you see Not that yet. on the screen there? What I'm going to do oh, is, there it is. Once, I've, uh, once I've finished designing the star schema, I'll actually generate a data vault from the source system's um, almost normalized model just to show you that process working as well with another wizard. Oh, you're going to make them so happy. So I have a, a sales system um, sitting in a SQL Server database here. I'm going to go and connect to the sales system and reverse engineer it into a data model, uh, finding all the relationships between the tables and doing a generating an entity relationship diagram. So all I do to do that is right click here and say discover. And 3D goes and discovers everything in the source system and presents it to me in an entity relationship diagram. So that's sitting here now. Now we can, this, you can see a, an overview of the diagram down here and we can zoom in and zoom out if we want to as well. So pretty straightforward kind of stuff. Yeah, I can now fairy dust. start. No fairy dust in this. Bunch of child Although, labor behind it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to run some about 20 standard profiling metrics on all the tables and columns uh, in the source system to, to have a look at what's actually there and have a look at some of the pro results of the profiling metrics. So this will take a little bit longer. It's computationally expensive running profiling. Uh, I can go and click on a table anywhere or on a column in a table and go and look at the profiling results down here from running um, certain metrics that we've got, look at the least and, and most common values that are in that table, um, how many rows, how many values are null, how many are populated, minimum, maximum values, lengths and all that sort of stuff. These profiling metrics are the standard canned out of the box ones we ship, but everything is customizable and you can uh, add your own profiling metrics as you want to uh, with an interface we've got in here as well. What's the internal development environment like? I mean, how do I, how would I add that? Is it, uh, you got Python in there or something? I uh, know like we've that? got our own interface for doing that. Essentially what you go and do is create a user 
uh, a user set of profiling metrics. You can clone one of the existing ones we ship. In this case, um, I'll just show you a standard one here. You essentially define queries. So if I want to define a query to, um, to do some basic string collection, I define that. I map the results of that to a number of variables and then I um, say whether I want those ones or not and you can group them together, including doing sampling and all that sort of stuff. No. So it's totally extensible. Anything you can do in SQL, you can do in here. And that includes calling um, functions you might choose to write yourself to, to extend it out to do some more complex stuff. Um, one of our guys has on Teradata written a whole suite of uh, metrics to work out uh, recommended primary indexes for Teradata tables. So that's a, a, an unforeseen extension of it. That's a, a really useful concept oh. as well. Thank you. So now that I've discovered the source and profiled it, what I want to jump in and do is design a star schema based on it. Before I do that though, I want to get an idea of whether these tables have transactional data in them or reference data, whether they're going to facts or dimensions. Uh, what I can do is go and resize all the tables in the diagram just to see which tables are big and which tables are small. So a nice simple visualization. I don't like using that word in this context, but there you go. And it gives us an idea that we've got um, perhaps four tables here that might contribute to fact tables. We've got order lines and headers, forecasts and budgets. <coughs> Everything else is small, so it probably contains um, dimensional information. So I'm going to launch straight in and design a new star schema based on this. It's useful when you when you source systems in a different language and you just can't read it and don't understand it. And you can just yeah, go, like SAP R three. I didn't say that. <laughs> so, so I have already set up um, some aliases for my canned dimension uh, for dates that I've already got in this um, that we that we have in a new star schema. So I've got four different date dimension views available here for budgets, forecasts, orders, and and ship dates. What I want to go and do is find the source tables in my source system and drag them in. I'm going to build a customer dimension. This is going to come from five different tables in my source database. The, the primary table it's coming from is my customer table. I'm going to make this a type 2 slowly changing dimension. So I'm going to add in some extra columns to manage this. And you'll see we've got a start and end date has automatically been added to the, to the table here. I'm now going to go and uh, add in columns from my five other tables. Starting with the city table, I'm going to take city name and state code and add them on. You guys make sure that your computers are muted in the room because we're getting a little bit of feedback. I'm going to add two columns from state. Ralph I'm going to add two columns from country. This is a bit repetitive. Again. Ralph does? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ralph, why don't you go ahead and ask your... I'm sorry, can I interrupt you a moment? I probably should have asked first. Ralph has a question. Go ahead, Ralph. Ralph? Yep, we can. All right, super. Let's see. I have to remember which of those questions I... Which of those questions did I send in? I was asking which version of SQL is used for customizing those profiling routines. Is that... Oracle SQL because they have all kinds of SQL for analytics extensions that we would love to be able to use. Or are we going to be limited to ODBC or is it Wearscape's particular SQL interpreter? That's a really good question. Um, you basically build the, a set of profiling metrics to work on a particular database. So if you're going to be running profiling against an Oracle system, then you can use anything that's available in Oracle. So it's Oracle SQL, Oracle Functions, um, including the extended analytic functions. If you're running it against SQL Server, then it's SQL Server SQL, Teradata, Teradata SQL, and so on. All right, that's, that's the answer I was hoping for. Yep. We do have another way of operating where we can use uh, JDBC function calls as well. So that's available as well, but most people when they build custom metrics want to use the, the power of the database they're working in. So now that I've designed this dimension table, it has five different source tables. You can see that down here. We can go and look at the data we're going to get if we ever built this. Because everything's data driven in 3D um, and we've connected to the source system and and designed this dimension based on what was in the source system, we can say, go and show me all the data that would be in this dimension um, if I was going to go and build it. And it's joined all the five tables together because we know how the source tables relate to each other. And it's showing us the columns we'd get in this dimension. And it's even added on a simulated surrogate key so we can see that there. So that's a pretty cool bit of functionality. 
I need to do this again for another dimension. I've got product and that comes from four tables. I'm going to drop that in as well. It's just going to be a type 1 dimension, so it's not going to have start and end dates. That's why it's a different colour. And I'm going to add a column from each of my other three little product lookup tables here. So I've got product group description. I'll add that in. I've got uh, product line description and product subgroup description. So there you go, four source tables. Again, I could do the same thing, show me the data. I could have a look at it. Um, in this case, we had a compound join, and it's picked up on that and joined it on two columns to a table, and we've got our sample data sitting there of what this dimension would look like if we were to go and build it. The final thing I'm going to design in here is, uh, well, it is a couple of simple fact tables. So I'm going to go and grab order header and drag that in to build a new fact table design. And I'm also going to go and take all the columns out of order line and add those in too. And delete the duplicate column that I got. Again, we could do a display data on that. But what I really want to do here is add the relationships in to my dimensions. So I can drag out to order date. I can do the same thing with ship date down here. Um, the same thing with customer. So I'm adding in the relationships here between the dimensions uh, and the fact table and the same thing out to product. So I've now got all the relationships defined in here. The screen's getting a little bit too busy, so I'm going to do a zoom and rearrange these tables. There we go, there's the star schema we've just designed. We've got a couple more tables sitting down here because I'm going to actually build two more facts. I'm going to build a forecast fact. The order header is the fact table? Oh, I haven't renamed it. Oh, I, should, oh. I should have called it something else, but got it. Yeah, I don't <coughs> okay. like typing in demos. You start making spelling mistakes when you do that. Well, as long as they're not obscene, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to drag uh, budget in and do the same thing and add in the joins for those two. So I've got a product join here and a customer join as well as a join out to a budget date, which is sitting over here. And then the same thing for forecast. I've got a product join. I've got a customer join. And I've got a forecast join, forecast date join. So there we go. We can tidy that up again one more time. And that's the layout that we've got. We've got three fact tables, um, two dimension tables, and a series of dimension views over date. Now, we could go and generate documentation for this. We've, we can actually click on a button and generate a design document. Um, before this session, I entered some useful information in here. So I entered in some information about what this contained. And that will all pop out in the, in the overview of our um, documentation. So I'm going to generate the document and have a look at it. And this still is, in 3D? I'm still in 3D. Oh. So this is a design document of the data warehouse that we think we're going to build. Mm -hmm. So this will contain all of the information um, about our source system that we profiled. So here's the, the summary information I'd already typed in. Uh, here's the information about our source it's system and we can see yeah, nice. results of profiling metrics against each table and column. And as we go down it shows us the same thing for the data warehouse. So we can go and look at the new data warehouse tables. There's our new fact table, which shows us the source tables it comes from, and assumed profiling metrics that's extrapolated from the source database as well. So that's cool. That's taken me, what, 10 minutes to get to that point? Now, using the new wizard that we've added um, to, to automate this process, I can go and do the same thing um, without having to do any work at all. So this is about, so it looks like you, I've done something. You science. just eliminated my automation. job. <laughs> I, just, I, I can feel the fairy dust. I've got to say, the first time they, uh, that uh, Jason that did it demoed it uh, internally to the guys, he said, this is my consultant replacement product. And I, could, <laughs> and I, and I called it the repository the No More Consultants repository. I had lots of friends after that. Uh, I was surprised they let you walk out of the building. I was bigger than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what I'm going to do now You're is... damn bully. Oh, don't do you questions? Oh, we have questions? Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, thanks. Um, hey, Jason. It looks awesome, by the way. Uh, it's, come, it's come a long way since the first days I started playing with it. <laughs> um, number one, do I get any royalties for the... Uh, I'm just I'm kidding. Um, What's your yeah, question, Steve? No, Steve, uh, Steve has actually made a number of suggestions, um, as has Richard, and, and I think, in fact, all of the suggestions from both of them have been implemented now. All right. So we, we do take feedback from you guys really seriously. No, it looks great. Um, 
Do you have like do you have uh, the concept of subject areas? Like if you want to divide those stars out into different subject areas, so you didn't have all your fact tables overlapping. Uh, so I can add a group, and I can manually add tables to a group, or I can go back into the model uh, and pick a fact table in the model, say this order header table, and I can say uh, add a new group for me. Uh, give the group a name, so it could be orders and then add every table that's within one join or two joins or three joins or whatever of that fact table. And if I do that, um, I've now got a, a subset model here you can see called orders in the tree that just contains those um, four dimensions in fact table and we just see that one model there. That's exactly what you meant, yeah, right? Yep, that's exactly what I meant, that was great. Okay. Another question from Ken Collier. Go ahead, Ken. Hey Jason, um, this is looking really good since last time I saw it as well. Um, I'm curious, and this is something we didn't talk about a couple of years ago. Um, the, this 3D makes it really easy to just grab everything and pull it in, which is which creates the risk of overbuilding your warehouse, which is a user problem, not a tool problem. Is there any way to encourage uh, selection of, of just the um, attributes that you care about for the current um, focus of your warehouse or how do you keep people, how do you discourage people from overbuilding? That's a really good question. Um, I've, I'm not sure if there's a product answer to that. What do you think, we, Mike? We need, we need guys like you, Ken, <laughs> using it. It's uh, Yeah, I think it's just a usage. Yeah, it is usage people and training. Process. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd, sorry, I don't have a product answer for that. No, that's a reasonable answer. It, it is a concern, though. Uh, you know, just the the you know, as as you make things like this really easy, uh, there's the you know potential for misusage. But that's not your problem. So, just wondered if you guys had a position on that. Yeah. No, no, I haven't thought that one through. Um, so, so everything I've done till now. I had to do manually. What if I wanted to do this with uh, by starting a, a wizard from a single click, answering a couple of questions and having the whole thing generated? Let's go and do that. I'll close this diagram down. I've got another repository here called my automated warehouse repository. I've got the same connection to the same sales source system in here. I'm going to click on this button on the, on the um, desktop and choose that connection as my source. I'm going to, oh, what happened then? as my source. I'm going to install my new warehouse in here, my new warehouse design. I'm going to automatically create all the categories, all the modeling types that I need to do this. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it my source system. We'll call it version one. And I'm going to say next here. It's going to create all these other areas for me. It's going to create a star schema, a logical model, everything. I can rename how things appear. It's discovering the source system now, showing me all the tables. And hey, these four tables are the biggest ones, so they're probably transactional. I'm going to go through and tick all the tables that I think are transactional. In this case, I'm just going to take the first four, because whether it's transactional or not determines whether it becomes part of a fact table or whether it becomes part of a dimension, generally. What if you don't know? Can you? It's OK. Just, uh, just tick it, and then you can always untick it yeah. if you, OK. Because like customer, you know, it's 3,000, it's close. Yep. But the name also tells me that <laughs> yeah. it's probably related probably to not. a dimension. Okay. This is just one Maybe wizard not. as well. Yep. Okay. Yep. Click on finish and off we go. So it's designing a star schema. There's the star schema it designed. We'll have a look at, um, we'll have a look at that again just in here. I'll just open a different model. So here's the star schema it designed. Um, we've got the three fact tables we built before, as well as the two dimensions we designed. It hasn't put the dimension views in. We haven't got an option for doing that yet. I could have done a fairy dust trick for that, but I haven't done that. Uh, then in that other model that it opened, it took it a step further, and it actually said, well, if I was going to send this to Wearscape Red to build it, what would I need to build in the way of staging tables and load tables to actually build all the processing to populate this from the source system? And it's gone and generated all of the tables to extract data out of the source system and then put everything together um, to define and build the star schema. So this is doing a lot more. Sounds complicated, but it's doing a lot more than what we did when we did it manually. It's taken it to the next step and worked out what we would actually need to physically 
put between the source system and the final data warehouse to, to build the code to generate the, so, the yeah. ETL. So previously like. all we did was work out the end part. Now we know that we're going to implement it. We already know what's in the source system. We know what the end part is. So we should be able to figure out what all the intermediate stages, how One I'm going to get data loaded and, into, yeah. I'm going to have to load it across into here, then I'm going to have to um, prepare Sweet. it to put into a, um, a stage table and that stuff. We know all that stuff. We've discovered the source system. Got a question from Ralph Hughes. Okay, Ralph, go ahead. Okay, hey, um, looks beautiful and exciting, but I've learned, having looked at a lot of these tools, to always ask, Building stuff, Greenfield, is really easy. The t real pain comes in when you have to change. So could we see how you would add new dimensions that actually change the grain of a fact table? Because what we're trying to avoid out here in the field is having to write really expensive data conversion scripts for rekeying our fact tables and moving billions of records into a new target schema. Yep, that's a good idea, and we'll, we'll let, let's go through this. I just need to set a couple of things up first, but we'll be we'll be ready in a sec. Okay. So we have, a, we have the ability in 3D as well to go and reverse engineer an existing data warehouse. So I've just created the, um, the model area to do that called an existing data warehouse. This has some special properties. I've hooked it up to an existing warehouse I've got, um, which isn't the one we've looked at today. Um, I actually need to go and change one more thing. I only want to bring in uh, fact tables and dimension tables here. I'm not interested in all the processing tables that exist in this warehouse. So I'm going to limit this um, reverse engineering to just be facts and dimensions, and then I'm going to discover that and generate an entity relationship diagram for it. Now, being pragmatic data warehousing uh, people, the person who built this data warehouse didn't create any primary keys or foreign keys in the warehouse, so we haven't been able to extrapolate the relationships between tables, so we're going to use a wizard to do that. I'm going to go through here, these are the tables we discovered. We're going to go through here and say, um, just to start with, we'll try matching on names, so match on names that are the same and generate foreign keys between the tables where the names are the same. <clears throat> That's not the only option we have. We can do fuzzy matching on names. We can look at the data and we can look at the profiling results as well. But for the purposes of this exercise, I'm just going to do this based on column name matching. That um, was one of the suggestions, I think, a couple of years ago. Yep. <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, and here we go. These are all the relationships that um, it thinks are right. And in this case, because this is a demo environment, they're the perfect set. And off <laughs> of we go. Of course they are. Um, we can profile this warehouse as well, but we won't bother doing that for now. And I'm just going to add some, um, some table type assignments here Could too. Can I ask you a question, though? When you say profile, it means a very different thing, I think, to me. I'm thinking data quality profiling. You're not. I am as well. In what way do you do? Because so, you're pulling up the actual data behind this. And yes. We're querying the source tables and running metrics against them. Now that's the first part of data quality. Yeah. But we also have recently added data quality functionality in here so you can determine validation rules and say whether or not those metrics have come back with what you're expecting. So that's now in here as well. And where, where does the, again, the profiling information is part of your metadata somewhere. The results yes. of the profiling information are stored in our metadata, but you can export that to, to anywhere else you want to. Hmm. Um, nice. But we're running it against the source system. So I, I'm, not, I, I'm not keen to cover this bit today because it, it, it's a bit more complicated okay. to go through. Just, but we do have business rule validation now um, for doing exactly this kind of data quality stuff. Huh. It's literally been added to the latest release. Yep. All right. Come up? Spill out into your documentation too. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. So we so on, that same, on that same note, on a previous slide, I can't remember if when Michael said it, he said it's kind of ishish. I can't remember or not, but the impact analysis piece as well. Oh, that's always been part of the software. Okay. That's core functionality. Okay. Yep. So we'll show you that when we get to the red product, but it's in here too. So, so to the question, what we can do here is reverse engineer, um, reverse engineer a data warehouse, and then. We can generate an entity relationship diagram for that, and then we can go and add in pieces here just by drag and drop. So if I had another source I wanted to add into this, um, I could do that. 
I could just drag another table in here. I haven't got anything that isn't already included, but it would just be a simple case of dropping something in and then uh, adding its key into the fact table or adding a relationship. And even if it changed the grain of it, it would change the model correctly, if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do now um, to move on is I'm going to send this into Wearscape Red. So I've finished my modeling exercise. Are you do your conversion to Data Vault at some point? Oh, yeah, okay. All right, Mike's just reminded me of something. The one other thing I was going to do was just show, um, we've got this concept now in 3D called uh, model conversion. So if you have a model of a certain type, we can actually, we've provided a generic infrastructure for specifying um, a set of different rules that you can use to change one type of data model into another. So if I've got, for example, a third normal form data model, and I want to convert that into being a data vault, I could do that because we've already defined um, the rules for doing that. I've got an empty model here called a data vault. Here's the discovered source system that I had before, um, my sales source system, which is actually a normalized or reasonably norm third normal form model. I can go and convert this to be a data vault. And all I do is say, convert, use my conversion rule. I've got a number of different ones, but use my conversion rule. And you can define these to yourself vault. if you want to. You can define these yourself. We provide a, um, an infrastructure for setting up your own conversion rules and, and a set of them in order that run to change you from one kind of model into another. Uh, and I'm going to run this now. And what it's going to do is take that source system, move it into a data vault, and then run a whole lot of rules over it to change the tables, to split out satellites and hubs, to put link tables in, etc. And this is what we end up with. We'll just have a look at this. So I, I won't go into the details too much of this. I, I'm not that familiar with data vaults. But what we've done is applied um, standard data, malt, data vault modeling rules to convert this to a data vault. Now, if you want to split, um, <coughs> If you want to split satellite information into multiple, or, or you've got a source table and you actually want to take different attributes and put them in different satellites because they're changing at different rates, then we have methods to allow you to, to go and can change the rules to do that kind of stuff as well. And we've got customers using this. You want um, to shrink down. <laughs> so yeah, welcome to Data Vaults. That's the sort of size Data Vault you get from, um, <laughs> from that many source with? tables. Yeah. Huh. All right, Data Vault people, comment. Anybody want to say something? But that's, that's part of the reason why you want to have these conversions and you want to manage it at different levels. So it's easier to manage a third normal form model and run a set of rules to generate a Data Vault when you have change uh, and then work out what the change difference is between the two versions than it is to actually work through manually and apply the changes to a Data Vault model. And we do have um, the, the car customer in, um, in Europe we were talking about before uh, using this functionality in their data vault based data warehouse. Okay, so now I want to send this into Wearscape Red. Yeah, oh, yeah. comment. Question? Hey, Jason, I had a quick, yeah, quick question. So this is, this is cool. I'm, I'm anxious to look at that a little more closely. Um, do you, have you guys done anything with anchor modeling as well? Um, the rules for conversion are not quite as um, well defined as with Data Vault. Have you looked at that? Well, we 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 know what a net, what that modeling approach is. We haven't pre-canned the rules for converting, but you can go and build that yourself in the product. You could um, have a look at how the Data Vault one is set up and clone it and change it to um, to do anchor modeling. I'm pretty confident that would be able to be done. Can you give a, a brief taste of what that uh, creating that conversion script would look like? Yep, so we have a um, have an interface in here. For example, if I go and look at uh, third normal form to data vault, uh, what it's essentially doing is applying six different rules to our data model to convert it. Um, the first thing it does is, is in this case, uh, take um, any entities that don't have a type, that have a referenced primary key, and it turns them into a hub and so on. Uh, anything with a fo that contains a foreign key to another object, it turns into a link and then it goes through some rules to split things out based on whether attributes should be in the hub link or in a, um, in a separate satellite. So there's just a series of different rules and you choose and pick different options for them. If you wanted to add another rule, these are all the different rules we have. So this is very generic, add entity, rename entity, copy entity, delete and so on, assigning different attribute types, merging and splitting things. 
So we've just given you a, a very, very generic approach to, to changing a data model into a different kind of data model. And we think that any kind of, um, any kind of conversion is possible. We, we did this originally with data vaults in mind, and then when we came to do a, the conversion process to go from third normal form to star schema, which is actually what we used in that automated warehouse build, um, we didn't have to add any extra functionality. So it, it was just a case of configuring it. Comment? On, cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to click on this red button and send it to red. <laughs> You're going to get there. I'm sorry, Dirk, here I have a short question, please. Um, that's, uh, that's nice in the demo uh, where every source table is very well designed, but in real life, sometimes you have to annotate and to say this table should be a link, this table should be a hub or a satellite. Is there a possibility to, to annotate the source tables if there's no yes. uh, wonderful VMF model? There is, and in fact, that's exactly how Volvo are using it. They are going and tagging source tables, especially if they want to break out um, some attributes into one satellite versus another. They are actually tagging columns in the source tables to say that should go into a particular satellite versus another satellite. And they're doing the same thing to override um, some modeling rules. There's some there's um, certain concepts in data vaulting that are very much up to the designer to decide. It's not necessarily 100% prescriptive in all places. So we have given people the ability to do that and that's being done by users now. So you just got a non-DM from Ronald there, Claudia. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, Ronald has a question. He's actually, I don't think he's on right now. Uh, he's not. But his, but his question is this, uh, if the data vault model is generated, it is probably not based on business keys, question mark, which is a problem. But Wearscape, please clarify. Yeah. Okay, so what? So that that's actually a really good a really good point. And what we did as part of the the process of working out how to solve this for Volvo was that, believe it or not, that was one of the things they said in about the first ten minutes of the conversation. So we do allow you to go and tag columns as being business keys, and then that's get, that gets used as tag part of the process. Tag columns as business keys. Okay. In the source model, and then when you generate the data vault, it looks at that and takes that through. Okay. Yeah. And I think I saw that on the previous screen, right? That's just the tick box. Yes. Yep. Yep. So it's a tick box against a column. And then in the rule definition area, the, one of the rules was look at the business key to determine um, how it should be structured. Yep. Okay. So here's what I'm saying. Make sure I'm right, since I don't know the data vault that well either. Um, they do allow you to tag columns as business keys in source in the source model. Yep. When the data vault model is generated, it carries the key. Okay, that's used to drive the process. I, can, I got 140 characters. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can't say anything in 140 characters, so good luck. Okay. Okay, right, so, so I, I clicked on the button to send everything to Red, and, the, and what we're doing is packaging up XML, firing it at Red, and then Red is loading it up so we can actually build this newly designed Star Schema warehouse. But we're also taking along the staging tables and the load tables. So the, in Red speak, load tables are the first level staging tables where we land data from source systems and files. Staging tables are on top of those to do transformations. So that's the red speak here. The two things can be seen as, as one, really. And I'm just going to load this up now using default options in red. And it's putting all the stuff into the metadata repository for red and creating it all um, as well. If I flip over into red, I've got a copy of red going here. Um, this is it. Let's just do a refresh in the tree. We should now see um, all the load tables that 3D designed, the staging tables it designed, as well as those dimension views. Uh, dimension tables, there's a couple of extra, that one, that one and that one are out of the box red objects, the date uh, and these other two and then there are the three facts we designed. So these are now sitting in red and these tables have been created in the database as well. Um, so I could go and, you know, for example, have a look at this budget table, do a display data in red and it's an empty table in the database. We also brought in um, the source system connection. So this points to where the source system really is. If I go and do a display data here and browse all the tables that are in my source, 
there are the tables sitting in the SQL Server database that we originally discovered and profiled. I can now load, because this load budget table is going to copy this budget table into our data warehouse from the source, I can go and load this and it should load the data from the source system. So that brought in 14,000 rows or whatever. Um, I could go and, and do this for every table and load them all up and so on and eventually process my whole data warehouse through to the end. So what we've done is cut out the manual work required to build all these load tables, which is, uh, for example, if I wanted to bring the customer table in again manually, drag and drop, give it a unique name, click on add, click on OK, create and load. So that has just been saved 12 times or whatever in this model. And then the, the work to build the staging tables, for example, I've got stage customer here. That comes from my five different tables. If I was going to build this manually, um, I would have to go and generate a stored procedure for it, um, click on set, specify this join again, work it all out, 3Ds pass that through, click on OK, uh, and then I can update that table. I'm not sure if this will work, all the source tables aren't loaded yet, but I think for customer it was um, that one. Let me just do this quickly. <coughs> that one, that one, and that one. And we should now get data in here. If I run the procedure, there we go. So we've now got data sitting in this table. And then from there, um, we can go and generate the procedure. It's been done for us as part of the load process uh, to read from stage customer into our slowly changing dimension. And that's now populated as well, 2,900 rows. Have a look at there, and there's our slowly changing dimension with a surrogate key, with an unknown value in case we don't find data in the source system, with start and end dates and a current flag and everything else. Now that would have been seven or eight clicks in here to do manually for each table at the dimension level. And we could take this all the way through to the fact level as well. Keep doing the same thing. So we've automated the process from discovering the source system all the way through to actually building this in a database. So I've done this in SQL Server. Um, say I want to take this into Teradata now. I've got a Red Data Warehouse built in SQL Server. Um, it's got too big for SQL Server. Red has sped up my development to the point that I've outgrown the database. And we've had customers in the US where this has happened. One springs to mind. They then bought, um, they're based in Florida. They then bought, um, bought Teradata and re-implemented the data warehouse in Teradata and all the stuff they'd already done in SQL Server, we managed to pick up and move over because it was already in our metadata repository. And all they had to do was regenerate code. And the process to do that is simple. I've got a Teradata warehouse sitting here. I've got no, I haven't got anything in this warehouse at all. I've just got an empty repository. I'm going to go and retrofit all that stuff out of SQL Server back into here. In reality, you'd actually do a metadata import and export, but that takes a few minutes to run. So we'll just show you the quick way of doing this. Um, I can go and point it at SQL Server, find those tables. So these are all the tables here we had. We could just go and add everything across. I'll just bring a couple of the load tables in to show you how it works. Uh, Say so we'll bring in these ones. I'm going to bring these into my Teradata repository. We've now got these three tables here, and I'm going to convert those um, to be uh, load tables in our repository. They will disappear out of the tree here and become loads. This is an intermediate area for moving things between environments. So this is forklifting functionality, if you like. And this is also really powerful when people first buy Wearscape Red and they want to bring in the stuff they've already got and have us manage all the impact analysis and everything as well. Have you been talking to the uh, Teradata um, data mark consolidation folks like Mark Sh Sherman? He's not in charge of that anymore. Oh. Shaman. 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 I'm but not sure it, about I, that. It have we seems to me that that. But he is in charge of their migration program, so he is somebody you ought to talk to. Do you know Mark Shaman? Uh, I don't. Do you know if we're talking with him? We've not. I'll make a note of it. Yeah. yeah. S H A I N M E N M A N. Um, and he is their director of migration stuff from Oracle and from DB2 and SQL Server and so forth. So the beauty of using us to do this is we automatically convert all the data types for you. So there's no you know, if it's, a, if it's a date time in SQL Server, it becomes a timestamp in Teradata. If it's a whatever, if it's a Varchar 2, whatever in Oracle, it becomes a Varchar in Teradata. But we expose the, the way we've done that. So if you don't like the way that those have mapped, you can go and change that as well. I'm going to create one of these tables in Teradata. 
sorry, it's a bit slower on Teradata. It's all running on my little laptop here today. Teradata okay. and SQL Server. Um, I'm going to specify this as a no. How many amps table. do you have there? Uh, I think I have two amps. <laughs> Hang on. I've just got a uh, an issue here where I've got this tagged as a set table. It needs to be multi-set. We'll create this in Teradata and load this from SQL Server. Um, we'll connect. It, we'll tell it it's coming from that source system we had in SQL Server before, and we'll tell it how to load the data. And we should actually be able to load this over now. So it's going to load the data for us. Uh, yeah. Just give me a second. This is a very small table. I just need to change the source, uh, and we're done. That should now load, and we've got data in here. So we've got data in Teradata from that SQL Server source. So we've converted this over, and the process would be the same. There's actually a, a, a better way of doing this in here do by backing up the metadata and bringing it into Teradata, but it takes about 10 minutes to run, so it's not easily demoable. But it gives you an idea of how it works. So that's actually pretty much everything I was going to cover. Wow. Have I missed anything out, Mike? Ralph has another question. Ralph, go ahead. Hey, I was curious what kind of tools you've given us for including schemaless source data in, say, HDFS into our, the designs and loads of our warehouse. That's an excellent question, Ralph. So, so we can, um, we can, if you have a special anointed license key in the current release of RED, you can use uh, functionality to browse HDFS and load uh, data from HDFS straight into a relational database if you want to. So that functionality is there now. It's the, I think the current release of RED is the first release that that's there, uh, and it's not there unless you're given a special license key to turn that on, because we're still playing with it. Yeah, what we found is um, the f our customers have been using 3D to explore the um, the, the non-SQL data and spend a lot more time on that than the actual building of it within RED. So we've, we've got the functionality in there, but we've restricted it. As I said, it's restricted on a, um, on a license key. I'm not sure if Jason's got it there. I haven't, but I have got, um, I, I can show in 3D that we do have HDFS as a source that we can, um, I haven't got a Hadoop cluster running on the machine, sorry, Teradata and SQL Server is the limit of what I can run at the same time um, <laughs> on this tiny laptop. But, but we can actually in 3D go and configure an HDFS source and then we will, um, you specify the URL for it, and we'll actually go and bring in all the tables and query them and generate an ERD if you want. Uh, and, and do data profiling off the HDFS data. So directly. we're pretty much, at the moment, we're pretty much um, p playing in the um, Hive style uh, area there. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's probably where we're going to be for a while because we're that, with that data warehouse with um, NoSQL as opposed to pure NoSQL. We haven't really explored the, the pure NoSQL space. The, on RED it appears exactly the same way and you can create tables and you can t use it as a source or a target and we could create exactly the same way but that's using um, Hive and um, and uh, HSQL I think. It's, it's so yeah, so, so RED can read from a, H, uh, a HDFS file system, read from HSQL and create target objects in HSQL. 3D can interrogate and profile HDFS. That's the current state of it. Is that a public feature? Yes. Let me suggest something that's a little simpler and has a slightly different use case, but I think is going to be uh, um, important, and that is just taking a flat <coughs> JSON file and and structuring it, making sense of it. So just reading each JSON object and looking at its structure and coming up where the common uh, the common pieces are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yep. No, we're not doing that at the moment. Yeah, and that uh, that kind of gets you into the you know into the web data because you know whether it's coming from uh, Twitter or uh, something like that. Um, I, I did some Python with, with Twitter and was absolutely amazed at the, uh, the amount of complexity and variety in the structure of the JSON. 
picking out things from a, t a Twitter stream is, is quite difficult. And now with the Internet of Things, you're starting to have smart devices that are not just, you know, emitting the same structure every time. It depends on the context. So, so the use case would be you got a you got a warehouse there, but you want to start tapping into these new, you know, external information sources that are becoming publicly available. Yeah, it's a good idea. It is a good idea. Okay, so um, I will show you one more thing, and that's automated documentation. So how can you possibly get to the end of automating the warehouse and not automate system and user documentation for the warehouse, given that you've captured all the stuff and metadata as you've, as you've done it? So I've just run documentation for the SQL Server version of the warehouse we loaded from 3D, and I'll display that. It's HTML-based. Um, user and technical, the user is really just a... Um, a uh, the same documentation as technical with some of the technical stuff removed. If we go and look at one of those fact tables we designed before in 3D and put into red, say the order header one, um, if we'd filled in description fields and so on, that would all be populated. Uh, we could even go and look at the code. Here's the code that we generated to update that table when we loaded it. Um, related tables, the structure of the table and where all its columns come from, um, a star schema diagram, trackback diagram, in, um, indexes that were created because this is SQL Server, uh, rows that are in the table now and space it's using, and um, anything else that's been um, captured as we've gone. So we can do that for every object type. We're also capturing a glossary, so all um, t business terms that are put in by users against columns and tables appear in this glossary, and there's a big list of those here as well. Now did that, where did that come from? Well, Wait, was this the conversion fairy dust? Yeah, it was. Terry no, Dan? this wasn't fairy dust. Um, because we had the perfect demo source system that we discovered, all the tables had comments on, them, and those all got inherited through into the data ah, warehouse. So it, the, uh, that's what I was going to ask yes. you. The metadata that was in the, the yes. source, the other data warehouse does carry over into yes, this new it retro. Does. And in fact, um, if we go and look at one of those source that's tables, cool. this is back in 3D now, we'll have a look at the properties of the source table. If we go and look at one of the columns in this table, you'll see we actually had a comment. So when we discovered that, it came through, and then anywhere else we pushed that through, it got followed in, but we could have overwritten it at any point. So if we go back into red and look at that same table, um, say look at dim customer, which was originally you know, which follows on from that, and look at customer name, the same comments in here, but we could go and edit that here or at any point if we wanted to. So we inherit the comments, but you can change them or remove them at any point. Still nice. fairy dust. What about, what about metadata that's <laughs> sitting somewhere else in, in a it. different source of like Erwin data, uh, Erwin models or? Yep. So, so the 3D product has the ability to bring in Erwin models and power designer models. And in fact, um, one of the four tutorials, uh, validate data model tutorial, that's built into 3D, loads an Irwin model, gets you to change it to be what you really want, say if you've bought a model, uh, then you go and build a data warehouse in that tutorial and then compare that back to the model because you don't actually end up building the model and show all the differences going all the way through. So yeah, that's standard functionality for us. Good, that's, I've done that in half an hour, that's amazing. Um, yeah, let me, uh, Jorge, why don't you go ahead and ask your question. Um, he's got a question about JSON a little bit. I don't know if he heard the earlier uh, answer, but uh, Jorge, why don't you go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, maybe I missed something. <laughs> I was a little bit late after the podcast. But I just wonder the effect of uh, the uh, uh, Teradata incorporation of JSON within the uh, within their design and in, in the future, and if that will affect uh, uh, Wearscape and on any means. The, the, um, I think safe to we haven't got our, our Yeah, this is new functionality in 14.10, um, and I have to say that we were involved in the 14.10 14 development process. We were a beta customer for about a year, uh, including having a shipment um, uh, equipment shipped to New Zealand for testing on. Uh, from, from Teradata Labs, and this never came up as something that was being added during the process. We just found that out now. So um, we haven't got our heads around it yet. That's why I brought up the JSON thing, yes. because I think you can help them in this area. So we're keen to look into that further, but we don't have an answer right now. Dan Graham is the, uh, the fellow to chat with here. And then Judd, I just sent, him, sent you his uh, email.
So did, he, did anyone work out where the fairy dust was used? On the which part? In the process. <laughs> where in the, in the whole thing I did today was the fairy dust used? Well, you did it so fast that I figured there was some fairy dust in there somewhere. <laughs> I think you guys must have contests to see who can who can do the demo faster than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know where was it. So, does so Michael know the answer. He does. Ooh. Yeah, he does. So, so there's one piece of functionality that's almost there and will be released by the end of the year, but was faked out by me today, and that was when I sent it to Red. Um, piece that sends the that's metadata. That's not for tweeting. For, that's <laughs> not for tweeting. Wait, what is? The piece, we, when I clicked on the button that says export to red, yeah. that button's actually greyed out. <laughs> so so that will be there by Christmas. We have a, we've actually contracted to provide that. At the that. moment people create it and then read it into red. So they do it. You can do it now, but it's not a single click. It's not There's a like button. a three step process at the moment. Uh -huh. so, Forward looking statements. So yeah. everything else today was completely honest functionality. That was the, a little bit of fairy dust just sprinkled around for that one thing. Uh, once again, as always, you guys have done an outstanding job. I'm very proud of you. I'm very happy for you. I think you're well on your way. Uh, certainly my thanks to you, my thanks to all of the folks on the phone. Thanks for hanging in there. Most of them did until the bitter end. Uh, thanks to Jason and, and Michael and of course, as always, to Scott for bringing them, bringing them in. We'll see you guys next year. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye.